welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about. Let's pray together. Father, we have come here today to share with you that we believe, that we confess you as our Lord and as our Savior, as our God. And Father, I pray if there's anybody here today that has not done that uh, and, and asked you to come into their lives for salvation, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And Father, that is your desire. And since it is your desire, it is our desire as well. Help us to praise you today. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that in all things that we do, that we will worship you because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So good to have you here with us today. We welcome you to the services of First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. And for all those that are here uh, watching by are here in the building and for all those watching by television today, we want to welcome you to our services. At this time in our service, where we spend just a moment or two welcoming, welcoming our guest. Uh, is anybody here from uh, uh, further away than California? Uh, well, you guys win the award today, right here on the front row. Two people visiting, uh, coming through our town. They're from California, and uh, not sure they came just for our church, but we're glad to have them today. So you welcome our guests and regular tenders today in a moment of fellowship and greeting.
Amen. Amen. As you're being seated, um, whoo, don't you just love worshiping him in this house? With his people, with his church gathered together. Oh, it's great. Just great. We're going to uh, sing one that kind of glues an oldie with a not so oldie. Is that okay? Put two of them together. See how well they play together. Dave's going to help us out on this one.
man. The power of prayer. You've heard many people talk about the power of prayer. The healing power of prayer, the comforting power of prayer, the uplifting power of prayer. My prayer for you today is that you have experienced the power of prayer. This next song talks about just, just that subject. Bowing the knee, whether you are able to do that physically or not, if you can, it's an extremely powerful position to put your body in, a position of submission to him. But if you're not able to get down on your knees anymore, for whatever reason, if you humble your spirit onto its knees, you'll get the same effect. So I challenge you today as a church and as worshipers here, as we worship him together, to humble yourself and to bow your knee to him as we sing together. lifting up his name in this place and in our hearts today.
Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 32 and 33. We're going to look at a couple of verses uh, today. Now, with Valentine's Day coming up, sorry, you guys on television, this is Valentine's Day, but uh, since we are on a week delay, but uh, today, guys, you still have time, Okay. <laughs> And so I thought I would give you a few pointers of how, just how something that might help you. And so I went to someone who was qualified to talk to us about this, Dr. Shannon Kalikowski. She's a psychologist, she's an author, but most of all, she's a woman. Okay? And so here's what she wrote. 
When we think of what we can do to nurture our relationship, we often think of tangibles. Buy her diamond earrings, take her out to an elegant dinner, buy flowers and chocolate, take a romantic trip together. While all these things certainly won't hurt your relationship, <laughs> at all, Dr. Shannon said, they aren't necessarily the strongest ways to connect with your loved one. The deeper component has more to do with how you interact together. It's called validation, she writes. Consistent, thoughtful validation of your partner's thoughts and feelings is the best thing you can do for your relationship. Acknowledging who they are and what they do as important. Unlike the conversation that an older married couple had, and the woman looked at her husband and said, You know what? You, ne you never tell me that you love me anymore. And he said, I told you I loved you when I married you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> that is unacceptable. <laughs> Another quick illustration. We have, in our household now, we have two little dogs. Okay? Now, our older dog, Sandrine, she's 12 and a half now. When she was younger, she, when I would come in the back door, she would just come running and, and bark and jump and everything. Now she's 12 and a half years old, and so when she sees me, she'll look up from her pillow and say, oh, how nice, you're home. Let's celebrate by you bringing me a treat. <laughs> but our nine-month-old puppy, whose name is Paris, when I come home, Paris just attacks me, wanting attention. She goes, ah, 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 ah. She barks, you know, and jumps and goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like that, you know. And so we have a ritual now. Whenever I walk in and she's attacking me like that, I pick her up and I look at her and I say, I acknowledge your existence in the universe. <laughs> and she goes, ah, and it seems to work for her. How do you acknowledge the people in your life's existence in, the un in your universe? Jill Meyer, another writer for Family Matters, wrote this. She said, appreciation and acknowledgement are important keys. So she suggests, this is to men, that you make a list of all the things that you find important and significant about your wife. And once you've made that list and prayed over that list, then you share it with her verbally. And she wrote, you have the power to turn your wife from crabby old Cinderella into a precious princess. By simply acknowledging her efforts on your behalf, you turn her invisible efforts into visible praise and appreciation. This is what we women live for, along with flowers and chocolate, just, be, just to be clear. And phase three, men, if the men that I'm talking to today actually do this, phase three is women, don't you, don't you, don't you say to them, you just did that because the preacher said to, do not say that. Reward good behavior with appreciation, and just maybe it will become a habit. Which brings us to our passage today, because how do you acknowledge our Creator? How do you acknowledge the one, for those of you that are Christians, the one who died on the cross for your sins? How on a regular basis do you say, I acknowledge and agree with and confess your existence in the universe? personally and publicly. Now, this is a difficult two verses to explain to you, but I'm, uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to try today because, and I hope I have your attention now because this is important, how we acknowledge Christ before others affects how Christ will acknowledge us before his Father in heaven. Let me say that again. How we acknowledge Christ before others affects how he will acknowledge us before his fathers in heaven. Listen to what he said, what Jesus said, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, you're a holy, awesome God. And the words of 
Jesus resonates in our mind, our hearts, and our emotions today. Lord, we have come here to be right with you. We have come here to worship you. So help us, Father, to learn something today that will not only affect our, the rest of our lives, but will affect our eternity. I pray that if there's someone here that has never publicly confessed you as Lord and Savior, that you would invite them again to do that. And I pray, Father, that, that they would choose you today and that they would let all of their fear be gone, replaced by the power of the Holy Spirit to make that wonderful confession of Jesus. And I pray, Father, for all of us that are here that may be dealing with being secret disciples or secret service Christians, that maybe we too will be challenged to publicly confess you and acknowledge you to those we come in contact with. Lord, there's so much here for us to see today, but my prayer is, is that your Holy Spirit will teach each person here, regardless of what I say or how I say it, I pray, Father, you will speak to the hearts of those who are listening here today and those who will watch on TV later. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing that we want to take a look at is, how will Jesus speak of you before his Father in heaven? Will Jesus confess you before his Father in heaven? The Bible says that Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Well, what does the word confess mean? Well, let's take a look at that. The primary Greek word for confess is homologeo. And what that means is, is to say the same thing. To say the same thing, have the same word. And then to agree, admit, and acknowledge that that is the truth. Now, the context of where we find this word determines what that word means. You know, we have lots of words that we have no idea what it means unless we have a context. Uh, for those of you that don't know, this is my wife Robin up here. If I were to make the comment, Robin is cool, what would I mean by that? Well, you, there's no way for you to know. It could mean that she is moderately cold. She needs a sweater. It could mean that she is fashionably attractive and impressive. In other words, she's got it going on, you know? I mean, that could mean... It could mean she's composed and calm. She was cool as cucumbers when she sang today. Or it could mean she is less than cordial. Your wife seemed a little cool to you while you were using those illustrations about her today. Better get that list ready for Valentine's Day. On top of my list is she's got it going on, okay? <laughs> so confess can mean to acknowledge sin or it can mean to acknowledge someone or something about that someone. So reflected here in this particular context, it's the secular Greek word that is used, which was used in a court of law. And it is to denote a solemn, binding, public testimony. So confession of Christ is not a private matter. It is a public declaration of allegiance and acknowledgement to him. Uh, one of the simple ways that that word is used that many of you know this verse Romans 10 9 and 10 it says if you confess that's that word uh, homologeo uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth again the, the word uh, the Greek word for confess confession is made unto salvation so when we confess it, we are acknowledging and we are agreeing with who Jesus is and who he is in our lives. Just saying the words doesn't magically make you saved, but if the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, a supernatural result of that relationship will be an inclination to acknowledge Jesus out loud. And it begins with a personal confession, as we just said, a personal acceptance of Christ by grace through faith 
results in the Holy Spirit enabling us to public acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. In other words, you shall be witnesses. One of the evidences that the Holy Spirit is in you is that you have the power and the inclination to declare that in a public fashion. A witness is someone who can testify about something that they have seen or experienced personally. The power and courage to witness is provided by the Holy Spirit. If we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit. And that means obedience becomes the issue. So Jesus is saying, I have given you, given you everything you need to obey me. If you have a personal relationship with me, then you have the power to say so, and it is my desire that you say so. I mean, let's, let's just take an a earthly relationship. Uh, what if I personally acknowledged that Robin is my wife, but that I didn't publicly acknowledge that she was my wife? Let's just keep that a secret, you know? I don't want really anybody to know that you're my wife, okay? What if I did that? That relationship would not be so good, okay? Well, apply that to the Lord. If you're out there and you won't publicly acknowledge that you are part, that you are part of the church, the church is the bride of Christ, and you are denying him, that is the opposite of confessing him. We have been called to confess him as our Lord and Savior. Luke 12, 8 adds to this. It says, also as I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. In other words, everybody in heaven, Jesus is going to confess, I knew you. Instead of saying the opposite, depart from me, I never knew you. Oh, you, that, that would be the most horrible things in all of the universe to ever hear is for Jesus to say, depart from me. I never knew you. But Lord, I went to church. Uh, and that, Remember that Sunday in February? I was there. Depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. So what does it mean practically for us to confess Christ? Well, when the Holy Spirit invites us to be saved, we agree to believe and to receive Jesus into our lives. That is personal confession. We confess and acknowledge Jesus. We accept him as our personal Savior. We ask him to forgive us of our sins. We admit that we're sinners. We say, I am sorry for my sins, and I want to turn from my way of living to your way of living, Lord. And then we say, we confess with our mouths, Jesus is my Lord. I declare, I agree, I acknowledge that, uh, that I am submitting myself to the Lordship of Christ. I believe that God raised him from the dead, and I believe that when I ask him to save me and forgive me, that he did do that. And you know, the scriptures say that if we confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For it's with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So after personally being saved, a next step would be to acknowledge that in a public way and seek to obey the first command of our Lord after salvation, and that is baptism. Jesus gave us baptism as a way to publicly profess what's going on inside of us. It is a public profession of an inward decision that we've made, something that God did. God saves us. We don't save ourselves. Baptism in and of itself doesn't save us. But when we confess him publicly, he gave us an easy way to do that. When we're in the water, we basically are saying, I believe in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we're put under the water, we're saying, I believe that Jesus was placed in a tomb. And when we come up out of the water, we are saying that I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that he is the son of God it is a public profession baptism is a way to do that so when we have the invitation a little bit later if you have never publicly said I have prayed to receive Christ in my life we give you the opportunity to come forward and acknowledge to the congregation these witnesses out here that which is a very safe place to do it that I am a follower of Christ, he has come into my life, and I would like to follow through in scriptural baptism as a way to publicly profess 
and acknowledge him. The next way we publicly confess Christ is by the way we live our lives. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. Our goal is to love God, love others, and by his power to live the life that Jesus died on the cross to give us. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Folks, let me just say to you that yes, we are saved by grace through faith. Matter of fact, let me read that scripture to you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we don't quote verse 10 very often along with that. I'm going to do that. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Folks, when we get saved, the evidence of that is that we are going to do good works. We do not do good works to get saved, but if we're saved, we are empowered and encouraged by the Holy Spirit to do his good works as he defines what good is. If you are not doing those good works, then you are not publicly confessing him before men. And we all have different ways in which God uses us in the public arena. So as this context is specifically referring to, sometimes we will have opportunities to public acknowledge Jesus when it's not easy and it may even cost us. Many of the disciples that he was was speaking to at this time, they were martyred. They gave up their lives for confessing Christ. A genuine possession of Christ in one's heart will surely lead to a confession of Christ with one's mouth. You see, confessing Christ is kind of like putting a label on a can. You know what this can is labeled? What it says that it is? It's got a picture on it, and it says on it, French-style green beans. So all the little green beans looks like Pepe Le Pew, you know. I, I, I don't know why they're French-style green beans. They could be grown in somebody's garden around here, and they put it in a can, and there's the label. Must be French-style. Parlez-vous français, you know. <laughs> now the question becomes, if Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20, that we read a moment ago, said, Christ lives in me. He's the one who loved me and gave himself for me. What kind of label would you have on you if you were a can? Would you have the label of being filled with God's Holy Spirit? Would it say, filled with the Holy Spirit, human being? Now, we wouldn't want anybody to eat you or or have you cut up in little pieces, but just stay with me on this illustration for a moment. If you were labeled... Are you labeled by what the world says you should be, or are you labeled by what Jesus says you should be, and I should be? And would there be a warning label on you? Have you ever picked up something and there's a warning label? You know, beware, or attention, or danger. You know, on my label, I'd want this on the warning label. Warning, this human will talk about Jesus anywhere, anytime. Listen with care. (laughs) Confessing Jesus in a personal and public way, however the Holy Spirit leads you, is important. I had another illustration I was going to use, but one of our uh, newer attenders in our church handed me a poem that he wrote this morning, and I thought, okay, God, you vetoed that illustration. Let's use this one instead. Listen, Dave Manzella wrote this. Uh, He's uh, been attending a few weeks now here in uh, our Sunday school class and is is actually here today uh, over in the second row over there. Let me read to you what he wrote. Uh, The poem's entitled, His Love. Another day has slowly passed by, My love for Jesus I will never deny. He gives me comfort when I cry. One day to heaven I shall fly. I am ready to make a new start. Jesus is truly healing my heart. 
His love is highest on every chart. Nothing can rip his love all apart. I pray morning, afternoon, and eve. From my heart, his love will never leave. He loves us all and won't deceive. A never-ending love from him we receive. God is with us through both good and bad. Remember, he loves you when you're sad. He will always love us more than a tad. For he is truly our heavenly dad. Isn't that the coolest thing? Thank you, Dave, for doing that for us today. He didn't know that that was going to be publicly. I I asked him before I used it, but when he brought it and handed it to me, he didn't know there was going to be a public profession of how he feels about Jesus. But he had the opportunity today, and when I asked him, he said, sure, Pastor, you use it however you want to. And so you guys got to be blessed by it. Well, that's the positive part of this message. Let me get into the negative part. How will Jesus speak of you before his Father? Will he deny you before his father in heaven look at verse 33 but whoever denies me before men him i will also deny before my father who is in heaven i want to read to you second timothy 2 11 through 13 this is a faithful saying for if we died with him we shall also live with him if we endure we shall reign with him if we deny him he will also deny us but if we are faithless faithless he remains faithful he cannot deny himself deny Jesus before others Jesus will deny us before the father in heaven let's first of all define what deny means deny means a firm refusal to accept as true in the dictionary in this context it means to disown a person or in this case the Lord Jesus as master to disown him disown him rather as Lord Savior and God now this type of denial is an ongoing denial it's not a denial where you have a momentary uh, lapse of fear or lack of courage, and, and, and like Peter did. Peter said, I didn't know him. He was scared to death. He was, he was shocked by it. And, and he repented, and, God, uh, and Jesus forgave him uh, for the, the denials that he had predicted that would happen in his life. It's not that kind of mess up. We, we all mess up sometimes. We miss opportunity. Even in my life, I'll, I'll, I'll walk away from something, I'll think, man, I could have shared Christ with him. Why didn't I? I didn't really say I denied Christ. I just didn't confess him, and there was an opportunity, and I missed it. And then I repented of that. I said, Lord, I missed it there. I am so sorry. I'm not talking about that. The denial that we're talking about here is describing a life decision to deny Jesus. We can all look back on missed opportunities, but this denial is about rejecting Christ and living apart from him forever. Robin and I usually listen to books uh, on, on CD going to and from the various places we go. We were in Atlanta last week, so we had a, a book, and not sure I would recommend the book, but it was a theologically based sort of book, a uh, fictional book, and we were listening to it, and there was one illustration on it, though, that I do, I've baptized it, and, and <laughs> I want to use it today, because they were trying to explain, one of the characters was trying to explain what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And as they were explaining what happened to Adam and Eve, they talked about what God wanted and what they chose. God wanted a face-to-face relationship with them with nothing separating them. What separates us from God? Sin, rebellion, distrust. That's what separates us from God. And so God wanted a face-to-face. But Adam and Eve as well come to the time where they stopped trusting God and did not want to have a face-to-face relationship So Adam turned from God instead of choosing his path, chose to go his own path. And when he did that, he put God in his shadow. And he chose to go his way instead of God's way. God desired the face-to-face. He wanted to walk with Adam in the garden. He loved Adam and Eve, and he wanted to, them to experience that. But they, when they chose to disobey him and rebel against him, they put God in the shadows of their lives. 
and walked off away from the light into the darkness. Yes, God put them out of the Garden of Eden for reasons that you'll have to read that story to find out. But my point is, is because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we can turn back and have a face-to-face -face with him as the blood of Jesus has, has allowed us to be forgiven of all of our sins. And no longer will that sin separate us. Or you can keep walking on your own away in the darkness if that's what you desire. And that will lead you to hell. Let me be very clear about that. If Jesus denies you before the Father in heaven and he says, I never knew you, you will be separated from God forever by your own choice to walk in the darkness. My suggestion to you would be to turn around and walk back to the light of Jesus Christ because of what he did on the cross. He made it possible for your sins to be paid for, for your sins to be forgiven. One of the things that uh, one of the governors of Rome said, his name was Pliny the Lesser, he said about Christians, he said, there's something about true Christians. Let me read to you what he wrote. These men were given opportunities to invoke the gods of Rome, to offer wine and frankincense to the image of the emperor, and how he demanded as a final test they should curse the name of Christ. And then he added, none of these acts, my emperor, it is said, those who are really Christians can ever be compelled to do. Even the Roman governor confessed his helplessness to shake the loyalty of a true Christian in acknowledging his God. So today, in a friendly atmosphere, during the invitation, you are going to be given the opportunity to confess or deny Jesus. You may be thinking, oh, Bob, you shouldn't be able to put people on the spot like that to, to, to confess Jesus or not confess Jesus. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't want it ever to be said of me that I didn't tell you what this meant. If you can't confess Jesus Christ and acknowledge him in a place like this that is so is friendly to that kind of decision, then I think you'd have to ask, am I really a Christian? Do I have the power of God's Holy Spirit dwelling within me? Because if you do, the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses. When the power of the Spirit is flowing through your spirit, you will be able to. You can question is, will you decide to? Let me tell you about my personal testimony. An evangelist came to my little church when I was a teenager, and I had made the decision that night, as many of you have heard me tell many times in my testimony, I made the decision that night that I was not going to go up there in front of that church. I'm going to wait till tomorrow night. You know what? The devil doesn't care if you wait till tomorrow night. Doesn't care a bit. Because tomorrow night he's going to convince you to wait till tomorrow night. Or the next day. Or the next week. The devil will tell you anything. To convince you not to confess and acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here he is with his arms open wide. Uh, if we could see a picture of what he looked like uh, as he walked the earth after his crucifixion, you'd actually see the holes in his wrist and in his, in his side and in his feet. You would actually see the scars that he bore for you so that you could be in relationship, so that you could step out of the darkness by the power of God and approach God again face to face. You can do that today. You can confess him. So there I was sitting on the back row. I mean, I'm telling you, I was so far back in that little church that, you know, if I'd taken any more steps, I'd have fell out the window. That's how far back I was. So the invitation was going on, and it was just, you know, everybody was emotional, and several had gone to the front of the auditorium to publicly acknowledge and pray to receive Christ. And, and, and you know, I was all under conviction, and I decided I am not going tonight. I am not going tonight. I am not going tonight. And the devil was going, yay, yay. And then my Uncle Richard came back to where I was and said to me, 
Simple words. Bobby, why won't you be saved tonight? I did not have a negative answer within me. There was no good reason not to. And I looked at him and said, okay. And I went forward that night. And I knelt on the pew about this far from the altar with one of the deacons of the church, uh, Brother Chuck Miller. And he led me in the prayer to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And they stood me up in front of all those people, which probably was about 120, you know, not nearly as many as here today or watching by television. And I stood up and I publicly professed that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior and that he has saved me. And then a, a week or so later, uh, we went to the baptistry, and the baptistry was uh, right behind the choir, just similar to what this is, only over to the pulpit was here. It was over here. Uh, and I publicly, in, in the baptismal service, confessed that I believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I confessed him as my Lord, and I said to the world that could see me at that time, I am a follower of Christ. That's what he asked you to do. And the words of an old song comes back to me as I think about that experience. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own, but I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Folks, you could walk down an aisle every Sunday 10,000 weeks in a row and you'd never get saved. What saves you is the grace of God in your life. He offers you salvation and you acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit comes in and saves you. That's what saves you, not coming before a church or walking down an aisle. The only reason you would come down here today, the only reason we give you that opportunity is for you to publicly say to the world, I am a follower of Christ. And if you've not been baptized by, by, uh, in a baptistry by immersion after conversion, which is the first command that Jesus gives us after being saved, he says, repent and be baptized. So when you repent, you say, I'm exchanging my way of living for your way of living. So you turn away from the land on the east of Eden, and you turn back because of Jesus, and you once again are face to face with God forever. So, the question becomes today, will you acknowledge Jesus today? Will you deny Jesus today? The answers to those questions will affect how Jesus will speak speak of you before his Father who is in heaven. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me right now. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, here's a sample prayer just to help you to confess him. And you can pray it with me right now if you've never asked Jesus to save you before. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I am sorry. I come to repent of going my way instead of your way. I want to exchange my way of living for your way of living. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were placed in a tomb. And I believe that God raised you from the dead to prove that you were the son of the living God, which I believe you are. I confess you as my Lord. And I commit my life to you as my Lord. And upon my commitment and my belief and my obedience to do what you said to do, I pray that you will save me. Make me one of your children. And I invite the Holy Spirit to come and live in me forever. Please save me, Lord. Please save me.
Maybe you're a Christian here today. And you've already prayed that prayer before. And maybe your prayer is something like, Lord, I have personally confessed you as my Lord, but I have never publicly confessed you as my Lord. I'm sorry for that. Please forgive me. Please give me the courage to publicly confess you as my Lord today. So today, I don't know what God's going to do with you, and I don't know what he wants you to do. But here's something that I do know. I know that he wants you to turn from your way and have a face-to-face with him today with no sin or no rebellion or no denial standing between you and him. Father, my prayer is today that those that are in this place will do whatever it is you want them to do. I can't make the decision for them, Lord. I don't even know what the decision is. But Lord, impress upon their hearts what it is you want them to do. If it's to be saved, help them, Father, to have the courage to come and let one of our altar counselors help them. Father, if, the, if, it, it, if they just need to pray for courage to not deny you where they find themselves most of the time during the week, then I pray, Father, you will give them courage to do that. If they need to be baptized, Lord, I pray you will give them courage to say, I want to, in a public way, obey my Lord and be baptized. So, Father, as I always pray, and it's the desire of my heart, thy will be done on earth in this place as it is in heaven. Always, always in agreement with you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.